faces today. New Faith, how many people, this is their first time at a meeting here for us? Okay, not as many as I thought. Because I know that there are people here that heard about it, for example, through Towns Union Master Gardeners Association. So they live in the area. They could easily have come to previous meetings. So welcome to those people who had not been to the previous meetings. Um, okay, date time. I have the agenda if anybody wants. I, I only print out like seven copies because not many people pick it up, but that's, that's fine. Okay, our presenter, Dr. Mark Cipollini, will be coming in at about 11 <coughs> to teach us about chestnut blight. In our first email that I sent out, it had said, oh, then afterwards we're going to have tree plantings. It turns out they are only replacing the chestnut trees, the specific ones that they previously planted that did not make it through the winter, and there are two of them. <laughs> so the tree planting is going to be two trees. <laughs> no, this is, this is uh, and with the neon system that sort of had a mess, on the sign-in sheets, if your, letter, if your name was in bold, you had been on the, as a member, but apparently you aren't right now. So you may want to, is this what am I putting in screen, part of this? So it's, it's, it's over at the, I was, Beasley Knob. No. Beasley Knob off Highway Vehicle parking lot where you pick up the trails. And in that field below, uh, in the fall, we planted native plants in there. Uh, going according to the Connect to Protect system, if, I, if you're not, is anyone not familiar with that? It's a way to uh, get information out, particularly about pollinators, native pollinators. And so I think it's under the offices of the University of Georgia. Okay. And so they put together short rules to go by. And right now, what I'm mentioning here is that we are in the process of um, applying for certification. So it involves putting together the whole list of plants you have, so they can make sure they're natives. Um, make sure that you have at least three species that would be blooming in the spring, three in the summer, three in the fall. Uh, some three species that will provide um, for larvae, so little caterpillars will eat on them, which is okay. I know people are like, oh, the bugs are eating on them. If they're native butterflies, that's part of their life cycle. So good for you for having that. So that is um, proceeding, not, and we're actually, the, it turns out, we just learned that the Forestry Service, which is on forestry <coughs> property, but the Forestry Service has agreed to pay for the split rail fencing around it that will, I mean, there's a way to walk in and go around inside, but so that when they go through occasionally and mow down the rest of the field around it, they won't mow down our garden, which we ran into when we were in Florida. But okay, so hopefully this will be protected from that. Uh, anything else you think I need to say? Well, I think we need, need to say that that Connect to Protect garden is going to be used as a seed bank. Oh, true. The 10 acres that they have that is grass, mostly grasslands there, um, which is not part of, not actually where the OHV trails go. It's the, you use the same parking lot, but the 10 acres yeah. below that. <clears throat> they are slowly getting rid of all the invasives in there yeah. and will be planting natives in there and they want to use this as a seed bank for that and other and locations other. on National Forest property. Yes. Uh, I, um, last spring I went to uh, Mulkey Half to look at the pink lady slippers okay. and the, the big issue there was that Forest Service had inadvertently burned at an inopportune time. So they are, when they work with conservation groups and, and these areas of importance are called to their attention, they're happy to adjust their burns accordingly. Yeah. And that's, that's very good because they're actually, the most recent email I got from our connection with uh, Laura, Laura, Laura Brown. Laura Brown, I almost called her Laura, and that's not, <laughs> Laura Brown. Um, said that they're going to be having a prescribed burn sometime in the next few months. So we want to make sure our garden is not. Yeah, they will be. But there's nothing growing right now. It's, it's dormant. It's, it's, they're mostly, mostly, but not all. Angles and perennials. We have a couple of bushes. It's about the time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Under recent events, I have the fact that our vice president had to step down, and I think I put that out in one of our. Maybe it was just an email to the board and the, and the committee heads. Um, so, 
if anybody is thinking they're looking for some way to help at a higher level, please let us know so that we can replace the vice president. Now, there weren't a lot of specific jobs that were you know, allocated to the vice president, but one of the things was, if I'm out of town when there's a meeting, they step in and cover the meeting. Uh, so I don't know that that's going to be happening yet. But uh, then there are lots of other tasks that we need to get better labor for, like trying to contact um, municipalities to try to encourage them to use native plants because of all the benefits, lower maintenance and all that, all the good reasons for having native plants. Uh, there, there's lots of other ones too that we would, would need there. So if you maybe don't want to be vice president, but are maybe interested in trying to pitch in in some other way, we'll maybe put together a list and send that out on the email so you can get that. Um, and uh, what I put under upcoming events is that the chapter bylaws will be available online. Uh, we haven't been updating our, our link, the chapter link to GMPS has not been getting updated as frequently as it should be. But uh, so, um, but one of the things that I'm going to say in our annual survey is that yes, our bylaws are available for anybody that's interested. But I have to make sure that it's there before I say that. Okay. So this, you are Dr. Cipollini? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we don't have to wait fully until 11 o'clock. Go ahead, Charlie. Okay, I'm just going to let him come up so we can start doing, getting this set up. Sure. Okay, Dr. Cipollini is going to be talking to us about the chestnuts, chestnut blight, which chestnuts were an, an important key species in the forestry ecosystems around here. And then this blight came in from, where did it come in from? Was it Asia, in, from just somewhere in Asia, okay. Okay. And I mean, Japanese chestnuts, actually. Okay, so, and they were bringing those in on, you know, it wasn't sort of an accident that the ch other chestnuts came in, but the blight wasn't supposed to be coming in with it, of course. Um, and so he's gonna be talking about that and the process, the difficult process, of trying to replace those chestnuts um, because of the key role that they play, keystone species. Okay, um, while you're looking on oh, you can just come on very quick. Received his BS and MS degrees in biology from Indiana University in Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. PhD in ecology from Rutgers. He's been at Berry College since 1995, so he's been there for quite a while. Um, and his research involves longleaf pine and the American chestnut. So this isn't all that he's doing, but this is what we're hearing about this time, anyway. Uh, he annually leads large groups of students in service-learning projects on and off campus, which is a wonderful way to engage students and get them interested in something that they might not have even been noticing. And he has helped direct the Blight Resistance Breeding Program, which is part of what he's going to be talking about here. Uh, since it started, okay, and established, helped establish numerous chestnut orchards across Georgia. Now, does that include places where they're actually taking the chestnuts to take somewhere else? I'll talk about, I'll talk about all the different kinds of orchards. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because I. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, folks. No, no, no. All good. No, no. All good. He's authored over 50 peer-reviewed papers and about 150 professional presentations and. I don't know if this counts as a professional presentation, but yes. he's presenting because he's professional. <laughs> Not very professional, I can't get this slide <laughs> That's my computer, and I probably have completely dead. I'm sure he knows how to work on the computer. Okay. I just can't find how to. Uh, there you go. Okay. Do you want me to talk Yeah, what do you want to Sure, why not? Bicycling. Fishing, guitar, and accordion. Now, I used to play guitar. I definitely do bicycle. Fishing, I did as a little kid. My, our son is more of a fisher. And accordion? That's probably pretty cool. I don't know if he's going to demonstrate that. Perfect. Okay. So, play something wild on the accordion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm turning it over to you now. You want this? Uh, thank you. Sorry. You want this up? <laughs> yeah, I guess you can bring it up. That would be great. Um, so, thanks. Sorry, folks. Uh, that Russell Scenic Highway is really scenic. <laughs> uh, a lot of fog.
fog up there too so oh, today, good. so it took a little while to get over the mountain. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I, as you just heard, I'm a professor at Berry College. I've been involved with the Georgia chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation for about 18 years, though, here, here in the state. And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about, um, well, why are we worrying about trying to restore chestnuts? What's the problem? What are we trying to solve? And then go over sort of some of the methods of things that we actually do, uh, the ac actions that we take, and sort of set the stage for what we think the future is going to be like in terms of restoration, actually getting uh, trees out there in the wilds in sufficient numbers to actually be, say, you're really, really honestly engaged in restoration. In a case like uh, the American chestnut, the main issue are diseases, and, and getting disease-resistant stock is the first step of that. And the group that I work with, the American Chestnut Foundation, has been working for about 40 years now. So they just celebrated their 40th anniversary, or birthday, they're calling it. Um, um, uh, it's a long time process. You're working with trees. You're not working with breeding, you know, annual plants or breeding fruit flies or something like that. You're breeding trees, which take generations, you know, long periods of time to work with. So it's a long-term pro uh, process. But having the proper stock to be able to try to engage in restoration is the real, real issue. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So you should, hopefully, as native plant people, you should know about. American chestnut. Sorry, I don't know if that's appropriate to do it that way. Um, so, um, so the tree itself, right? There are accounts that suggest that it was probably up to 25% of the trees, especially in the Appalachian Mountains, fine, right? Uh, it, it extended in Georgia, uh, actually into the coastal plain. Certainly all over the Piedmont, especially here in the mountains, but definitely way down in the Piedmont, and then even on into the, uh, into the, uh, into the plain, into the coastal plain. So that map there on the side sort of shows what, where most chestnuts were concentrated, which is the darker green, and uh, the lighter green includes much, much of Georgia. Right? And, uh, you know, uh, as of the early 1900s, they were plentiful. They grew straight and tall. Uh, they produced nuts every year, great timber trees, great for wildlife food, for human food, uh, for uh, all sorts of products. Uh, in fact, in the Appalachian Mountains, American chestnut was sort of the sort of the base of the economy, not for not just for wildlife, but also people. And they built things from it. They're one of the few cash crops they had were chestnuts. Uh, they ran their hogs and other animals on them in the wintertime, you know, and and fattened them up on chestnuts in the fall. Uh, so it was really important. And the two diseases that I'm going to talk about, you probably have all heard of chestnut blight, right? Most of you, at least. Well, in fact, the first problem was not chestnut blight. The first problem is this thing. And in fact, we have it here on this, on this spot where we planted trees last year. Jim, you're smiling because, yeah, smiling. you know, we, we planted all these trees last year and it's always a risk. Because this thing is a, is a disease that is perhaps even more devastating than the, than the blight. It's a root disease. It was also introduced from Asia, probably uh, through the Port of Savannah in the early 1800s. And it started working its way north. By now, it's, it's up into Pennsylvania. It's sort of a subtropical species. It's more related by to algae, actually. It's kind of like a parasitic algae is what it was really like. They call them water molds, but this is Phytophthora cinnamomai. Uh, it causes a disease that's called black root rot or black ink disease, uh, and it is just devastating to chestnuts. It's devastating to 5,000 different species. It's not just chestnuts, believe me. This is not specific to chestnuts. And it's spread around by horticulture and agricultural practices. It's soil borne, so anything that has been contaminated, once it's contaminated, that site is forever contaminated. So um, as native plant people, you probably want to be very careful about moving. When you're moving from site to site and you're planting things in different sites, you probably should be cognizant of the fact that you should be using clean tools, clean shoes, spray your shoes with alcohol before you go visit a native site. There's, there's actually things that are very important when you're actually trying to put things into wild or semi-wild con conditions to avoid spreading around this thing. 
uh, many, 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 many sites in Georgia have this problem. Um, it kills from the roots up. So when, when this thing attacks the trees, this is why I say it's even more devastating than blight, because it kills the tree entirely. As I'll show you in a second, blight generally just only affects the upper portion. It's devastating, yes it is. But the trees still can re-sprout from the base. It doesn't kill the roots. That's not true with this. This kills it entirely, yes? Is this also what's affecting <clears throat> the oak trees, the red oaks? Uh, not <clears throat> specifically, no. No. Uh, we're, we're not, I don't think anyone's 100% sure about what's going on with red oaks. Um, oaks in general are having problems. Probably a, a lot of it has to do with the lack of fire in, in systems. They, our forest should, even up here in the mountains, the forest should be burned every 10 to 20 years at least. And that's not happening. So um, oaks are suffering as a result of that, as a, as a group. Uh, I, I'm losing red, red oaks in my backyard area. I, it's not this. It's not, it's not this. Now there is what's called sudden oak disease that everyone needs to be aware of, planting oaks from other places. You're probably not doing that. You're probably using it. If you're planting any oak trees, hopefully you're using native trees from Georgia. I, I, you know, anything from <clears throat> horticultural stuff, you can spread this sudden oak disease. It can get on to um, alternative hosts like uh, rhododendrons and things like that and can transmit it. Uh, so that has happened. It, it has it been reported from the state some years ago coming in on some rhododendrons. So uh, in any case, pretty bad disease. And uh, we planted pure American chestnuts here. and. Uh, I don't know who's here from the center. Claire here. Hi there. Is it is it Claire? Who, who's I'm Claire? Claire? You're Claire, and you are I'm Pat. Pat. Okay. Um, I think we planted twenty, didn't we? Yes. We planted twenty. And do you know how many are alive? Um. Well, I uh, less than half for yeah, sure. Right. There's a few that are out there right. that I held on to yeah. because. I don't want to throw any ditch anything before it's time. Yeah, so sure, there's sure. a few that were pretty iffy last yeah. summer yeah. that you know other people are like it's dead. So, so there are treatments. So you can keep the trees alive, but you do have to treat them every year at least. And uh, that's not true with blight. There's no there's no treatment for blight. So there is you know if you have an orchard or small planting or something like that, and you have, you know plant chestnuts in it, you can actually keep them alive um, with treatment. And it, it's, it's sort of like a, it's phosphate-based fertilizer is really what it is. But. So in any case, the second problem is chestnut blight, which many of you should be familiar with. It started, it was first discovered at least, in the, in the Bronx in New York City. And this chart just shows you the timeline. By the 1940s, it was down here in Georgia. It moved its way west into Mississippi, Alabama, Mississippi. And eventually um, wiped out four billion trees. <laughs> four billion trees were killed for this. Um, it's sometimes considered the largest ecological disaster, but you know we're we're seeing other things experience this. Our ashes are being wiped out, and hemlocks with hemlock woolly delicate. So this was probably the first biggie um, uh, where an introduced disease is causing serious, serious problems. Now this is a fungal disease; it's passed through the air. There are alternate hosts. Fun um, this fungus can survive on various oaks, um, <clears throat> uh, scarlet oak, uh, post oak. Red or white oaks, it doesn't matter. They, just, they, they, they can actually persist. They generally don't cause serious problems on those. They also, of course, persist on Asian chestnuts. That's how they got here. Asian chestnuts, as it turns out, are resistant to both of these diseases, both the blight as well as the root rot, right? And so that's going to factor into one of our solutions for how, how we address this problem. It has to do with breeding with uh, resistant material. In any case, you can see um, this map. And, uh, the way that the fungus works is, it first of all, it puts out this, um, this acid right here, oxalic acid, small organic acid, and it kills the tissue. So it puts it out, it kills the tissue, and then it grows into that dead material. It's a particular pattern of lifestyle that this particular kind of fungus uses. <clears throat> um, it, it's kind of like it likes to feed on dead wood, so it kills it first. <laughs> Kills it, then it feeds on the dead wood. Right? <coughs> so it produces these cankers, and uh, in American chestnuts, once the canker starts, in, in a very short time, it completely envelops the and girdles that stem. It doesn't go below ground, though. 
So it kills that stem, everything from there on up is dead, and they still can re-sprout those. So you can see here, this is one that these two stems are clearly on their way out, but you can see the root re-sprouts coming up around the base of that already. Now those root sprouts can grow up, and uh, they can get some size on them, um, but inevitably they're going to get the blight again. Right? So there's no, they, they don't become immune to this or anything like that. Now our largest trees, let me just back up for a second. Our largest trees that we have found in the whole state over these many years are up in this area. The state champion was for a period of time up in the Brasstown Bald Wilderness. Well, the first one that was named was right there on the access road, the paved access road to the top. One is right on the side of the road, and as far as I know, it's still alive. Then one is out the Arkacaw Trail. That, that replaced that one. <laughs> And then the third one now is on Springer Mountain. Um, in fact, Jim, were you there when we cleared that out for the first time? Yeah. So it was probably about 15 years ago. We found this tree. It's about three inches in diameter. It was right along the road up in the um, um, Horn Mountain, Springer Mountain area. It's Hawk Hawk Mountain, maybe. Springer Mountain area, in any case. Um, we refer to that whole area at Springer Mountain. <clears throat> um, and uh, we cleared around it, did a little fertilization. A tree died near it. <laughs> And that thing grew up to, it's like 65 feet tall now. And about, at this point in time, it's about, I think it's about 14 inches in diameter. But now, that is now the new state champion tree. That's as big as they get, though. Um, that is as big as they get. That's, those, are, those are sort of outstanding examples. They're all high elevation trees. They're, that might have something to do with slowing down the blight. The other thing is, up here, um, in those areas, there's a form of the blight that seems to be less virulent. We refer to that as hypovirulence, hypo meaning less. The less virulent strains. And another place you could see the uh, trees like this is right in the parking lot of Anna Ruby Falls. Do you all know, all know where Anna Ruby Falls is, right? Right in the parking lot are two American chestnuts that were planted there by the former caretakers there. Um, yeah, I think about 20 years ago, something like that, 20 or 25 years ago, and they're still alive, and they still produce nuts. Uh, we collect nuts from them every single year. But they have this form of the blight that is just weird. It doesn't really produce these sunken leaf of cankers. They, it produces this kind of naughty stuff that just the tree seems to fight off. And, and for some, it's not the tree being resistant, it's the fungus being weak. So that seems to be predominant up here. And so while they can persist for many generations as a result of that, right? Probably not because of their own intrinsic resistance. So I'm blabbing a lot. So what can we possibly do about this, right? So for a period of time now, um, well, let's say 40 years, the uh, American Chestnut Foundation has been engaged in back cross breeding. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works. And it, in terms of bringing resistance genes from Asian chestnuts into the American chestnut population and trying to develop trees that have the resistance from the Asian varieties but still have all of the necessary genetics from American chestnut in order to perform well as big forest trees, good forest trees. Biotechnology, the, the term is referring specifically there to inserting resistance genes, period, just the resistance genes themselves and the necessary regulatory molecules that are necessary to uh, have those work, to insert those into uh, otherwise pure American chestnuts. And uh, Scott Merkel at UGA is, is in fact engaged in some of that work uh, with us. What he does is he takes little embryos out, out of a, a nut. This is a, a nut that would have been collected in like August. The, you know, they mature in September or October, right? This is a, a immature nut. And, they have multiple embryos in there. And he takes those embryos out and he can propagate the embryos. He can clone them, right? Make many, many copies of them. And that's the material that they use to, ch to try to insert the gene in these genes. So Scott has done this a number of times to try to develop different lines that have uh, a resistance gene in there and they're otherwise they're pure American chestnuts. So that's what we mean by biotechnology. And the biocontrol, that has to do with introducing this hypervirulence into strains of the blight. So there's lots of virulent strains of the blight out there. If in some way we could make them sick, 
this hypervirulence that I'm talking about is actually a uh, sexually transmitted disease that the fungus gets. It is. And the way this works is that you have a fungus that has the disease, right? And then you have another fungus, and they're different mating strains. They have to be different mating strains. They have to be attracted to one another. <laughs> if they're attracted to one another, their hyphae grow together and fuse together. The disease, it's a virus. The virus gets transmitted from one to the other. Right? So as long as you have compatible mating strains, this hypovirulence will spread through the population. The problem is, here in the United States, there's many different strains of the blight. And many of them are not compatible with one another. So this hypervirulence doesn't spread very well. It's found in certain locations, but it's not spreading, right? In Europe, um, hypervirulence has actually spread. There's far fewer strains of the blight. Uh, if you think about it, it's logical, because in, in Europe, they've long had a cultivated chestnut industry for thousands of years they cultivated chestnuts. They had their own chestnuts. They had no reason to import Chinese chestnuts, right? No, no incentive to do that. Where here, our, our trees got all wiped out. We had depended upon the wild trees. And what do we start doing? You know, we start, when we see problems, we start importing Chinese chestnuts. That happened all over the place. Uh, Callaway, Callaway Garden was a good example of this. They uh, went in the 1930s and imported lots of different Chinese chestnuts to try to you know, address the problem. And what do you suppose? You know, they're importing the, this material, likely importing different strains of the blight coming from Asia. So now we have all sorts of different, you, you, there, I saw a study that showed a one tree that was, uh, had a bunch of cankers on it, and they had seven different strains of the blight on that same, that same tree. So it's, it's pretty difficult here, but, there is a program uh, involved. There's a couple of different approaches to it, but um, there's this development of what's called a super donor strain of, um, of the blight. And basically, a super donor is like, eh, you do it with anybody. <laughs> and so it's compatible with many different strains. And so if you can introduce this super donor into a population, you could possibly get this hypervirulence to spread through the population. So that's what the approach of biocontrol is, to use these hypovirulent strains to weaken the blight. And uh, our, our organization believes that you know, some combination of all three of these approaches is going to be necessary to really, really ultimately solve the problem. So we're going to talk, uh, finish talking here today uh, focusing on the breeding program. So I'm not going to talk so much about biotechnology or, or the uh, biocontrol. I'm going to talk about the breeding program. So uh, this is one of my colleagues, this is uh, uh, Caitlin Kahn here, and she is pollinating a tree. See the catkins there, this is in about June, and there's female burrs right here, and we've collected pollen from another tree, and she's, excuse me, putting, uh, putting pollen on, on that little burr, right? So this is the uh, stigma style sticking out of the female burr, that will produce the burr with nuts in it. And of course, we got the pollen from other trees, these are not self-compatible, so you just have to take the pollen from another tree and put it on this tree, and you're good to go. Now, in nor normal situations, we'll have bagged these ahead of time. This is a little demonstration that we're doing there for the photograph, but ordinarily what we'll do is we will bag them ahead of time so they won't be pollinated by other things. Then we'll come back a couple weeks later, we'll take the bags off, we'll pollinate or put the bags back on. Right? So, so that's a controlled pollination. So why would we do that kind of thing? Well, we need to capture the disease resistance. So no matter what avenue that we obtain disease resistance, we need to breed that into other trees. We have to spread it around, right? Spread, spread the goodness around. Uh, because what, what I say, you know, you have to have disease resistance stock to be able to even think about restoration. Also, to capture genetic diversity, because this tree, as you saw, it extends from Maine the whole way down into Mississippi, on even into the southern you know, uh, plains of uh, Georgia. Um, that's a huge variety of different habitats, you know, high elevations, low elevations, uh, both sides of the Appalachian spine. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, reasons to capture genetic diversity. So in order to ensure adaptability so these trees will do well, 
You know, we didn't want to, for example, go to a state like um, Pennsylvania where there's lots of American chestnuts still alive. And you can get nuts and everything, you can breed with those, but you wouldn't want to be planting those all over the Piedmont in Georgia. That's not, that would not be an appropriate choice of genetic stock in order to plant here. So this adaptability is not only just trying to capture as much of the actual genetic diversity that's in the population, but also to work towards developing regional strains, right, regional strains, uh, that are adapted to a particular location, right? And in fact, that's one of the reasons for setting up this orchard here at, uh, at GMREC. This, we call this a mother tree orchard, and we're trying to establish trees from the south, pure American chestnuts in the south, from the southern areas, in order to actually do this breeding with them. So it's part of this regional adaptability uh, program to do this. So um, one of the things about this is classical breeding programs can't easily optimize both resistance and diversity. What I mean by that is we already have trees that are very re resistant. They're Chinese chestnuts, <laughs> right? We don't want to plant those. So those are the optimal, right? The optimal form from the adaptability is pure American chestnuts, but they don't have the disease resistance. So ultimately, the classical breeding approach has to be some compromise between the two. You have to get sufficient disease resistance in to have them survive, right? And that, but, that you also have to have sufficient genetic diversity to enable them to do well. Just sufficient is what you really need. Once you get that combination, then nature will take itself. It, as long as they can start to breed and sexually reproduce, then they can take off and solve the problem themselves. So it's introducing the sufficient amount of disease resistance and adaptability to get the pro process going. Because that's really what the fundamental problem is. If, if these things could constantly reproduce sexually themselves, they could probably solve the problem. They don't have a lot of genetic uh, diversity for either of these diseases. There's, they're almost all susceptible to both diseases. But as long as they could sexually reproduce over long periods of time, they could probably solve the problem themselves. Right? But they don't reproduce sexually almost ever. Those trees that I'm talking about, even those big trees, have barely been produced a couple of nuts, maybe. You know, They're just not. There's actually probably 100 to 200 million trees still out there, but most of them are this tall. right? By the time they get to flowering stage, they, they crap out. And so evolution can't work that way. Natural selection can't work that way. You have to have sexual reproduction to spread good genes right? and, uh, and to be able to uh, uh, you know, propagate the species. So, so uh, just I'm going to skip the next slide, but I'm going to show you this one. Uh, you know, we do these crosses, and the, the back cross program works kind of like this. So, uh, does this point work? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, in here, the red can think of as 100% uh, American chestnut, and the white being 100% Chinese. And so the first cross in a back cross program involves American and Chinese, and that produces this F1. So the F1 is 50% of each, right? The back cross <coughs> program then works by trying to take that generation and crossing it back to pure American. Right. You then get a tree that's the first back cross, 75%, 25%. But what you're trying to do is you're selecting amongst these to try to pick that 1% or that small, small level that have the disease resistance genes from, from Chinese chestnut. And you do it again and again, and ultimately you get a generation. This is the generation that the, chat, the uh, organization thought sufficient. This is now well over 90% American chestnut, and they had that little tiny percentage of Chinese chestnut genes in there. And uh, this would represent a family right here. They're all, all, all from the same parents, right? There's the two parents, American and E2. And these are all, you know, a family. But as you know, you know, you probably have, some of you may have kids, and they're not all the same. <laughs> got some good ones, you got some bad ones. <laughs> and, um, maybe, maybe fortunately, you can't just do what we do. <laughs> we get rid of the bad ones, we keep the good ones. <laughs> and uh, that's the way the program works, right? We generate these families. We then test the families. We test all of the offspring of these families 
and we try to keep the good ones. And again, the good ones would be those that have sufficient blight resistance, or we do the very same thing for root rot resistance as well. The ones we screen for root rot resistance, we keep the ones that are, have high root rot resistance, and otherwise have uh, ch American chestnut characteristics. So this is one of our orchards here. This, this is uh, near, near us, this is uh, the Henry Orchard. This was originally planted with about 500 trees, and at this point we have about 30 of them left. Wow. Right? And uh, our goal with most of these orchards, these are back cross orchards, breeding orchards, is to get them down to about one or two percent. We really want to select hard to pick the best of the best. Yes, go ahead. I understand the, the problem you're, you're, the primary problem you're trying to solve, but if you uh, produce a perfect line at the B3, don't you, is, it, there, is there a risk of a monoculture that can then be attacked by a new That's that's problem? why That's why we're talking about genetic diversity. We don't do this once. We do this many times with many, many, many different trees. The whole goal is to capture the genetic diversity that exists in, Ameri in American chestnut. We've been, uh, we've been doing estimates of what is, the, what is the genetic diversity and what are the patterns of genetic diversity in the American chestnut population. So for the last five or six years, we've been collecting leaf samples. We've, I've collected 50 samples all over the state here. All of them genetically analyzed looking for patterns of genetic diversity, and that's going to help guide our, our choices as to what to breed to what. And it turns out that the south, especially the southwest area, <coughs> like west of here, is the most genetically diverse American chestnut population in the whole, the whole thing. As you go further and further north, particularly once you get into Pennsylvania on up into Maine, you have very low genetic diversity. It's almost like they all came from the same set of parents going up there. But here in the south, there's all sorts of genetic diversity. As a matter of fact, there's been a, a sort of rediscovered uh, species. Uh, it's right now uh, Weekly, Alan Weekly, probably familiar with Alan Weekly, um, and uh, the uh, floor of the southeast. Um, he's recognizing this as a, as a species. It says uh, Castania alabamensis. It's a type of chinkapin, right? But it's definitely, it's distinct. It's on its own lineage. It's distinct from uh, American chestnuts and from Allegheny chinkapins. They don't cross with one another very frequently at all. Another thing they discovered is chinkapins do not cross with American chestnuts. I think chinkapins flower a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know exactly why, but they can find no evidence of ongoing um, crossing between chinkapins and American chestnuts. So yeah, we are not doing, but, I mean, that, that is the principal thing about the breeding program that we're working on is genetic diversity is extremely important. We are not do, going to do a monoculture. <laughs> Absolutely not. And uh, the other point about it is uh, once we get these out there, they, we hope, will start to breed with the native population, right? It's in, insofar as that's possible. Right? So yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, that's a little detail, but we produce a lot of different crosses. So I just showed you these uh, F1, B1, B2, B3s. I showed you what those are. But in order to uh, uh, try to get the maximum um, resistance, we have to do what are called intercrosses. So once we get to that third generation, for example, we cross them with one another. And right now what we're focusing on is a program called the Best by Best program. So we take we, let's say it's a third generation back cross. We've there are more than 90 folks, each state doing their own business. We've been doing things region wide. And so, for example, this summer, um, I'm, I'm going to show you this technique in a second, but we assess blight resistance in seedlings. We're going to, at Berry College, we're going to assess blight resistance on 600 trees from about um, five different states. And, and uh, UTC uh, at Chattanooga is going to test uh, 900 of the same, the same lines. So we'll test about 1,500 trees from this Best by Best program this summer. Right? Once again, the idea is to pick, you know, those were supposed to be the Best by the Best. We expect our offspring to be, have even better um, resistance on average. We want to pick among those for the best. Okay? So many, many different genetic lines in there, not just one. <laughs> And then we do some other weird things as well. Sometimes we, we do the odd crosses, and then 
Uh, this is a, one of the transgenics. We're still working with those transgenics. That's a, the oxo gene is a gene that breaks down the oxalic acid. The fungus makes the oxalic acid. This <coughs> breaks it down. The first product that came out was called the Darling 58, uh, now discovered to be Darling 54, but uh, we have assessed it over the course of the last year or so and have withdrawn support for it because it's just not performing well. It's, it's not nearly as blood resistant. There's, our, there's some other problems. It's, it grows less well than American chestnuts. So there, there's some clear problems with that particular version, not the gene itself, but the, the way it was inserted into the trees that are probably causing problems. And then we breed, we, we grow and, and breed other, other types as well. So, you know, we often get questions about, you know, American chestnuts versus Chinese chestnuts. And, you know, this is right here. Does anyone recognize that tree? Anyone from down there, Santi Nikuchi or Helen? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tree on, a, on a Hardin Farm. Hardin Farm for the chestnut. You know where that is? It's right, it's right on the little side of the hill there. It's a really nice big old Chinese chestnut. That shows you the growth form of Chinese chestnut. Uh, just no matter what, they're going to be uh, branchy and low growing and multiple, multiple stem. Short, fat, shiny leaves, not really distinct teeth. They're, they're there, but they're not really indented much. Shiny, waxy, green stems, big shiny nuts right here. Fuzz all over the stems, fuzz under the leaves. You know, it's kind of weird because there's fuzz all over these things, but the nuts are shiny. There's no fuzz at all in any of this stuff, but the nuts are fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got little fuzzy nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tall, straight, forest trees, right? These leaves, you can see it's a little duller. The, 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 it's a little hard to tell in this picture, but nice, nice indented, uh, even curly um, uh, teeth, right? We call them recurved teeth, and uh, completely hairless stems are hairless. Just that brown stems, not gray green stems. So when you have them side by side, it's very easy to to tell the difference. But um, you know, we get tons of reports of these, and we still end up having arguments with people, kind arguments, <laughs> informative arguments. <laughs> people are convinced that they have an American chestnut, and it's almost always uh, our reports. Anything that's on a farm in someone's backyard, they say this big tree has been producing nuts for years, Chinese chestnuts, <laughs> you can be guaranteed. On the other hand, if it's a small tree out in the wild or a natural forest or some, some area like that, we, we, we are surprised sometimes. We just found one that was reported to us in a neighborhood of Sandy Springs. It's like in someone's backyard, it's a little tiny remnant of forest, it's probably only as big as this room. And on one side is a mosque that was just built, or a, t a Hindu temple. And then and again, it's this neighborhood. And in this little, little patch, there is an American chestnut right in the middle of all that, yeah. right, right in the suburbs of Atlanta. So we do get surprised sometimes. So uh, uh, overall, we've done lots of crossing. So I started <coughs> getting involved in the program in 2006. Uh, so this is from uh, as of last year. We produced a total of 21,000 nuts. This is difficult. This is not easy to do. We've tried it nearly 500 times. That's 500 times we've crossed two trees together in some way and obtained a, a crop. And you can see all sorts of different generations here that we've been working on. So this is a little <coughs> summary of what we're doing. So I'm just going to finish up here with some pictures of what we do and just a little bit of how you can help that kind of thing. Um, yeah, we uh, have been growing most of our seedlings for when we grow seedlings are growing in the berry college. Planted in pots. This is the time of year we're planting them in pots in, inside the greenhouse. And uh, uh, nice, uh, nice facility we have there. But uh, we're probably going to have to diversify that. I'm retiring in a, a year. I'll lose control of the greenhouse facilities when I do that. And uh, I hope to have colleagues there that will continue continue the program. But um, I also emphasize that we don't have to plant them as seedlings. For the whole first part of our program, we did almost all of our planting by direct seeding. And it was very effective. As long as the site was good, you know, we had, you know, upwards of 90, 95% success. Um, 
I must have a picture of that in here. I can't remember what I have in here, but at UGA, um, down at the Hort Farm, UGA, uh, we've direct seeded that 300 trees and 99% survival. You know, after the first year, they're this tall. So it's really efficient because you put the seed in, they're already a, a seedling in the ground in that first year. Instead of having to wait a whole year, you're all messing around growing them in a greenhouse and everything like that. But in any case, we, we have been doing these programs where we test them. Uh, so we've had to grow them in the greenhouse because we're trying to test these seedlings in controlled conditions in uh, randomized studies. This is a student of mine, Shanna Lee. And again, this is Caitlin Kahn. And we're doing an assay called a small stem assay. The way that this works, and in fact, your trees that I'm bringing up here, where this was done to, uh, they were controls. And uh, I just brought two trees, by the way. I hope that doesn't. I, I, I got sort of a <laughs> school cassette. Who, who was it that said, oh, we're good. I thought you were bringing more than that? Was it Taryn? Is she here? I, 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 yeah. I thought that because they were. Yeah, it that's okay. Very high success rate. I thought. Now, well, well, I thought you were replacing all the ones that did yeah, not. Yeah, no, answer. yeah. I decided just because of this problem. You know, yeah. we don't want to put too many more eggs in the basket until we see how right. how this all works. Because they picked a little slightly different site. So, in any case, uh, the way that this works is we cut the top off, we inoculate it with the fungus, and over the period of 90 days, the fungus works its way down the stem, and we measure the length of that that necrotic zone, right? And in specific, they, there's sort of two bands. One is an orange band, and then beyond that's a little darker band, but it's the orange band, the distance that the orange goes, that is really highly correlated with resistance. So Americans and Chinese chestnuts completely different, right? They don't overlap at all. And then our hybrids are somewhere in between. And so we use this to try to select what we have been doing for the past uh, few years, is select the best 50% from the hybrids. Those are the ones we plan out to work with sites. So this is a this is a bit of what we're working on this summer as well. So uh, this shows you what can happen. Uh, um, this is on a really nice site. This is on the Roy Richards Orchard. These trees are two years old. Right? You can see they're well over her head. These are just planted. This was uh, in the summer. Uh, we planted these in February, and this is what these looked like a year before. Wow. That's how fast they can grow. They can wow. really grow fast. Now, once they get sufficient size in the, in the uh, field, we evaluate them for blight as well. And the way we do that is we pop a hole in the bark. We put the fungus in there. We just put some masking tape around that bark. And, uh, and uh, we evaluate it six months, a year, two years later. And this tree right here shows a really good blight response. That might look bad to you, but believe me, you, you Remember what I just showed you before about the big orange growing sinking tankers? That's not what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is it's effectively completely healed off. No matter what you do this to, Chinese or American, now what I want you to do, you're going to get a canker to start off with. The real question is, does that canker ultimately heal or not? And so this is showing a really good blight response. So at this orchard, the first um, 300 trees that we planted We've evaluated them this way, and we, at this point, have 50 of them that look good. So that's a really high percentage. And we're going to continue to follow them and follow them, but ultimately, we still are going to wean those down to the best, you know, one to two percent. Two or four, four or five trees, maybe. Maybe hedge our bets a little, right? Out of 300 that were planted. So, um, you know, this whole thing about genetic diversity, right? That, that is really important, right? As I was trying to emphasize before. But we have all these trees out there, and they're not making flowers. They're not making flowers, they're not making nuts. You want to run out and dig them up and transplant them? Well, that, people have tried to do that. That doesn't work that well, as it turns out. It's really hard to dig up the root systems of these in nature and pull them in. And, uh, you know, are there other approaches? You, there's been very limited success in trying to do vegetative cuttings and root vegetative cuttings. Chestnuts are known, oaks, oaks are known for this as well in general, but they consider to be recalcitrant. They just do not want to root very well. You might be familiar with some successes because this is the kind of thing that you might be battling. You ever heard of Hightower willow oak? No? Have you heard of that? Good. <laughs> I'll talk. What's that? 
It's a, it's a cloned oak. You know, it's, it's one that at, at UGA, a, a person, um, Eric Johnson, who does a horticultural show on um, um, uh, public broadcasting. In any case, um, he, um, he was able to clone this, and it, was, it took some time, but it, he developed several varieties of these things, and they are absolute clones of one another, right? So, but that was limiting success in oaks in general, and then chestnuts also just very difficult in making vegetative cutting. <coughs> uh, grafting is a little more successful, uh, but we, we, we tried for many years and it, we, we had a tough time getting it to work. This is one way of getting this vegetative material into orchard settings where they can actually have a chance of flourishing and doing well. And in recent times, uh, it's been the U.S. Forest Service has been working with us to do what's called, well they call it nut grafting, it's not really nut grafting, it's really, um, it's really uh, what will be called epicotyl grafting, but they spin nut, uh, they use Chinese chestnuts as the rootstock, and then the stem as it's still, it's just coming up out of the ground and it's very soft, it's still soft tissue. They actually take the woody tissue and graft it into that soft tissue, and they're getting success rates of somewhere around 70% success rate. And so they did this uh, last year, for example, I just saw the papers out in uh, the Chestnut Magazine that's back there, actually. And uh, I think the rates for Georgia were around the highest, I think around 70% in Georgia, and 19 different trees are, have been successfully cloned that way. And again, these are from trees that are out in the wild where we, they're not making nuts, they're not reproducing. Now we have them in a setting, we have multiple copies of them, put them into orchards, and get them up to breeding condition. So this has been a very important program in terms of the regional adaptability uh, and genetic diversity aspect. Now we still map trees. Uh, we still try to map all the trees. And uh, we do plant, when we do have American chestnuts, like we did here, we, we definitely plant them into orchards. This is one of the kind of orchards that we have. We call them GCOs, genetic conservation orchards. That's what this one here is intended to be. Um, and then uh, at UGA, they are continuing to work on trying to genetically modify <coughs> pure American chestnuts. So this shows you a, a map of the state. There's kind of a gap in most of the uh, 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 Piedmont, middle Piedmont here, but this, this is that zone down here where you have Pine Mountain. Um, this this uh, little population here was one of the sort of famous in around 2005 or 2006 was discovered to have flowering American chestnuts. That represents the most southern, uh, this little range right here, the most southern location for American chestnuts. Flowering American chestnuts. And as you can see, it's, it's focused a, a lot on, um, on uh, our national forest areas, both in this region, uh, western and eastern parts of the Tennessee National Forest. But again, we're surprised. We find American chestnuts all over the place. There was one right off I-75 in Atworth here that we discovered a couple of years ago. Two of them, as a matter of fact. Now this is color-coded, so the blues are uh, American chestnuts here, and the browns are, are Chinese chestnuts, and the greens are chinkapins. You get an idea there. <coughs> and uh, you know, with the orchards, we you know, obviously plant orchards. We did this last year here, and this is uh, us planting at that Roy Richards orchard. Various orchards of various kinds. A lot of this is done simply by just just by um, you know volunteers doing it on their own property themselves, or we you know larger plantations were doing stuff like this. That's the uh, Gilmer County uh, Master Gardeners group that's helping us there. Uh, just to show you where the orchards are, um, can you tell where Barry College is? Uh, yeah, that cluster is right in here. <laughs> so, for obvious, for obvious reasons. And then there's lots of actually in Atlanta, and that's uh, scattered all around. So, you know, the places we have them planted um, roughly approximates where they have been in nature. Right? So, what kind of orchards do we have? Uh, well, we just give someone a few trees just to see if they can grow them, if the site is good, it's a site test. Demo and educational, for example, the Carter Center, uh, Atlanta History Center, places like that, where it's public, public traffic. A lot of the, it's just a person getting a couple of trees for their backyard, we consider those demo and educational. They're going to 
tell their friends, teach their kids about it, that sort of thing, public outreach. Then we have uh, two different kinds of black back cross, back cross for blight testing and back cross for uh, bike talk or root rot testing. The closest one for this is at uh, Hurricane Creek uh, outside of Dahlonega. And uh, this project was set up by Jack Rogers. He's the current president of our organization, and um, they're, they're going to be planting uh, direct seeding about 100 trees this uh, in a few weeks um, to add. They'll probably end up having about 300 or so trees in that particular site. It's a collaboration with UNG. Again, the kind of orchard we have here is a mother tree or germplasm conservation orchard. And then we do have some things that are designed to test, test, um, test the kids. So we think this adult is good, we plant the kids out there, and we see if the kids do, do good. That's, that's what we mean by progeny testing. You're testing the offspring, right? So there's a, we have about three of those in the state. And there have only been um, there's one attempt at a restoration planting, and that's in Dawson Forest. Three, three locations in Dawson Forest were planted by a person from the DNR. And uh, we've had some folks out there looking to find these trees. And, um, it, they haven't done so well. It's not the tree's fault. It was just the, the site wasn't properly prepped and all that. So a lot of competition in those, uh, those clear-cut sites. Mm -hmm. So uh, in any case, this is the goal. <laughs> to end up not having to do all that stuff and end up having our focus being just restoration plantings going forward. How am I doing? Am I being too long-winded here? You're fine. No. Okay, fine. Okay. So these uh, demo orchards, uh, in many cases, what we like to do is we like to give folks a variety of things. So this particular guy, uh, John Bartnick, got five trees from us. Uh, each of them are different. So this is a Chinese chestnut. This is a Henry's chickapin, which is another Chinese type chestnut. And then this is a B3F3, that's a, a, one of our hybrids. This is another hybrid, that's another hybrid. So three different hybrids here, right? Now, these trees are uh, being resistant to root rot and all that sort of stuff. They always get a good head start. These trees may suffer. This tree here, it, to me, these two right here in particular look like they might be suffering from root rot symptoms. You can see this yellowing and drooping of the leaves a little bit there. Yeah. Um, he said they were still healthy, though, uh, but that's the kind of thing we look, look for. Now, you can spread this easily, uh, so that's one of the things. Before we go out to plant today, uh, we need to find some way to clean the boots of people who help. I don't know if we can do that. I should have forewarned you ahead of time. I think I did. I tried with someone. The first person who contacted me about this, but, um, and the tool. The shovel will be used to dig the hole. Just, just as a precaution, <laughs> so we don't spread stuff around. But we'll see if we can do that. If we can't, we just get a chance. In any case, uh, this was just an example of a project we, we distributed to this kind of an array. And uh, in, in a way, something like this tests the site and the caretaker. So the caretaker do the right thing, follow the rules, do everything right. And then if everything but the Chinese chestnut die, we know pretty sure that it's the root rot problem. We can test that and verify that and all, all that. If everything does well and the caretaker's done all the right things, then hey, we could add more trees. And several of these are, these uh, this particular um, project here are adding more trees in that property. Um, we do research projects of various kinds. You know, down there at Callaway, I mentioned to you that uh, they had um, set up, Callaway uh, had set up these Chinese chestnut orchards. He brought in lots of different Chinese chestnuts, uh, including this species, which is Castania henry, or Chinese um, chinkapin. Um, it's got sort of long, linear leaves. It really looks to me like an oak tree. It's also resistant to fire, by the way. Uh, chestnuts are adapted to resist fire, and the resprouting ability is probably another adapt, uh, adaptation to fire. This one is actually in the burned area, um, but it's a remnant of the, the orchards, and they're actually are spreading. I, I wouldn't consider them to be invasive at all, but they are spreading in the woods around the, 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 um, the old um. So this is interesting. It's, it's, it's a tree form, uh, an upright tree form of uh, Chinese type chestnut. So we're very interested in this as possibly a breeding source for resistance genes as well. Because this doesn't suffer the you know the growth form problems that Chinese true Chinese chestnut have. 
Here's another one that is kind of interesting. Um, this is a Chinese dwarf chicken pit. And this thing, uh, you, you plant on a seed by June, it's, it's making flowers. And then it makes flowers all summer long. And it just co constantly makes flowers and makes fruits. So by the end of the year, basically it craps out once the frost comes around, and you'll have all different stages of um, development on the same branch. It's a very kind of unusual, it's called uh, Siguinia, Siguin's Chinese chestnut. Chinese chinkapin, sorry, Chinese chinkapin. By the way, the term chinkapin, all that really implies is that they're one nut per burr, typically, one nut per burr. And um, all of our Allegheny chinkapins, for example, here in the mountains here, they're, they're one nut per burr. And then true chestnuts have two, three, four, sometimes more nuts per burr. That's, when you use the common name chestnut versus chinkapin, that's really all you're referring to. For example, um, the Chinese chinkapins that you have here, these are both what we would call chinkapins. They're much more closely related to the Chinese chestnut than they are to chinkapins here. They're on completely different branches. And this branch developed both single-nutted and multi-nutted, and this branch you know, developed single-nutted and multi-nutted. So the name chinkapin, is, that's all it really is. Well, we engage in science conferences. Um, this is a student of mine, Morgan, and um, she was presenting on this small stem assay, and she ultimately, we have these chestnut chats. These are great. Uh, they're usually uh, 11.30 on Fridays, uh, about once a month. This, this chestnut chat got started because of COVID, and we found out that it's really a highly effective way of getting information out to the public. And so it's really, they're, they're, they're very variable, my wife and I did one on cooking with chestnuts, right? And so it's all the history of stuff and, you know, genetics and, you know, these, this was student presentations. You know, so I had three different student winners for this um, scientific conference and uh, Question. They, they got to, yes. Yeah. Uh, is this something that we can uh, participate, listen in on over yes, the web? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. they, they, uh, they have a URL? They have, these come out. Um, just search for it? Yeah, so just chestnut chat, you can search for that. You, you have to register ahead of time. It's just name and email address. That's all you need, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they let you in that day. And it's and then it's also they're recorded. YouTube. Yeah. They're recorded. So uh, there's a whole series. You know, you can find the cooking with chestnuts one <coughs> on there. Right? They're they recorded. So yeah, you absolutely can. So and 